Let's talk about something completely different right now, um, because absolutely extraordinary scenes uh, at uh, uh, the, the hearings yesterday into the contamination scandal of, uh, of, of blood, infected blood scandal, uh, which um, we've been hearing from the most senior politicians so far, and that is the former Prime Minister, uh, Sir John Major. And he gave evidence yesterday and made some comments which I thought were absolutely extraordinary, and they not unreasonably prompted gasps of horror and uh, amazement uh, from those that are family members listening. He said that those who've been affected by the infected blood scandal, um, and bearing in mind up to 30,000 people were infected with HIV or hepatitis C from contaminated blood, the biggest treatment disaster in the history of the NHS. Thousands have since died as a result of that. Um, he said that it was incredibly bad luck that those people had been infected and he was justifying why his his government and Margaret Thatcher's government did not uh, provide compensation for those people. Well, let's talk to Jason Evans. He's founder of Factor 8. That's an advocacy group for the victims of the infected uh, blood inquiry. Good morning to you. Morning, Julia. Uh, Jason, your, your response to what uh, Sir John Major had to say. Yeah, I mean, as, as you point out there, there were gasps of horror in the hearing room yesterday. I mean... Look, it's. I think it is easy, um, and I was one of the first ones yesterday to be critical of John Major for saying that. But to me, I think you know the, the deeper thing behind that is, I, I don't think you know he he was maliciously lying uh, when when he said this. I think it shows just a complete lack of understanding and education about the scandal. I mean, if you look at the evidence the inquiries heard over the last three or four years to put this down as bad luck is just wrong was as, as well as being in bad taste yeah i mean this is the thing this wasn't sort of oh my god uh, we, you know we had no idea and and this infected blood was given to these innocent people who came in who are hemophiliacs and, and people who had operations and and they, they got it and we had no idea and the moment we knew about it we did something about it the reason why there is this inquiry is because it was very likely that blood would be contaminated. It was a blood that was imported from the United States in the 1780s, often bought from prisoners, sex workers and drug addicts who were paid uh, to give their blood. It wasn't properly tested. It wasn't... We, Cursory checks would have shown that we were at high risk of HIV uh, and, uh, and hepatitis C. And once they knew that it was happening, there was then a grand scale of cover-up to, to stop this becoming exposed. And even worse... They continued to give blood they knew was likely to be infected to people being treated on the NHS. I mean, I, it's, it's criminal is what it is. I mean, it's basically manslaughter as far as I'm concerned. Well, look, we, we saw a great example of exactly what you're talking about just a couple of weeks ago when uh, former health minister, uh, now Lord John Patton, gave evidence to the inquiry. And he was shown a copy of a letter from early 83. So this is you know, two and a half years before these products ceased to be in use. Yeah. And that letter was sent by the UK's most senior epidemiologist working at the uh, Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre. He sent a letter to the Department of Health saying these factor eight blood products, which is what we're talking about, these uh, pooled, highly mixed together blood products imported from the United States, he said they should be withdrawn from use until the risk of AIDS had been clarified. So they knew, they knew that they were high risk. The minister was shown that letter. He said um, that he never saw that letter, but if he had, he would have pressed the panic button. Those were his exact words. And, that, and what year was that? That was in early 83, so two and a half years after that date, these lethal products were still in use. Yeah. I mean, it is absolutely extraordinary, and so many families. I mean, we, you know, have seen you know mothers you know, giving evidence who've, who've lost their children, infected in you know early years, and and then you know dying in their teenage years. And again, this was at a time when you know HIV was a death sentence. You it would very very lead to AIDS, and the treatment was you know was was very 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 sparse, and uh, not the sort of treatment we have available where people can live for many decades, live a completely normal lifespan. I mean, what do you think is going to come out of this? Because a lot of people are saying also his his evidence wasn't really very forthcoming and we have seen Andy Burnham he described the scandal as a criminal cover-up he's the former Labour health secretary and he's I have to say all credit to Andy Burnham on this he has actually spoken out on this but this is this is not the first 
I don't think it will be the last sort of scandal we've got in the NHS where whether it's about, you know, what's happening at you know, maternity hospitals or, you know, heart, heart operations, things like that, where when there, a problem is identified and people come forward, management don't listen, the health department doesn't listen, no one listens, no one wants to know, and everyone tries to cover it up and the people who speak out are the ones who are castigated. This happens again and again, doesn't it? Well, I think, I think one of the reasons why is, I mean, that's what you just identified there in relation to HIV and treatment. I mean, of, of the 1,200 or so people that were infected with both hepatitis C and HIV, one of which was my own father, mm. there are about 200 of those people still alive today. The vast majority died by the mid-90s because, as you say, there was no effective treatment. And so you end up in a situation where the state, somebody has to now turn around and say, actually, we've got, you know, a thousand, two thousand people dead yeah. because of the actions of the state. And look, politicians find it difficult enough to apologize over the most minuscule of things, let alone, you know, two thousand dead people. And, and, and let's be clear, this isn't people, you know, going out and happening to pick something up. That, that you know, would be incredibly bad luck the term John Major used, but when the state gives them a, a, a product supposedly to help them and help save their life, which is actually killing them, that's not incredibly bad luck. That is a massive exactly. failure by the state. Oh, I, I, I'm so sorry for your loss, but all credit to you for uh, you know, being a founder of, of, uh, of, of Factor 8 and, and, and actually you know, standing up for your other family members as, uh, as well who've lost loved ones. Really appreciate you joining us, Jason Evans. Thank you very much indeed. A uh, quick word from Alex Dean on this. Um, this is such an abject failure of the state, uh, but it's also an abject failure of the NHS. The people who are meant to look after us, we're supposed to do this worship over the sacred cow of the NHS. I mean, let's all clap. How many different stories do we need to hear about abject failings? The m mistakes happen. People make mistakes. The first time you realise there's a mistake that happens, if I make a mistake, the worst thing I can do about it is libel someone on air, right? And then, oh, an Ofcom complaint. Um, I, you know, we could get fined. I, I could go to court. But no one's going to die as a result of the mistakes I make. If you work in a, in a field where someone, some people will die if you make mistakes, why would you not want to rectify that mistake as soon as possible, Alex? The NHS does some things well and some things badly. Uh, and that is a statement of heresy, it seems, in modern culture, where we're supposed to treat the NHS as if it's some kind of national religion. Yeah. Uh, and actually, that's to the, greatly to the detriment of patients, that attitude. It's also to the detriment of the NHS itself, because it prevents proper examination of what it does. You know, you might find in, in, in one given year that we do cancer well and we do heart disease badly, and then another year vice versa in the international league tables. But people refuse to accept that there can be anything like statistical analysis, proper evaluation, improvement. In, yeah. in treatment. You have to say everything's fantastic in the NHS and all is well in the best of all possible it's, worlds. It's sort of 1930s Russian, you know, uh, pig iron production, tractor production up 4,000%. No criticism is permitted and that's actually terrible both for patients and for the NHS yeah, and when itself. we say terrible, it's not just, oh, we won't make a profit this year for a private company. It's people will die. Sure. That's what it comes down to. Um, 7.42 is 